Amen. What a blessing to be ushered into the presence of God with singing, with song, with adoration. Praise the Lord. Good evening, Bible Baptist Church. Praise the Lord. You know, I'm normally not ever nervous, but on the way up here, my wife was having some pains. <laughs> I was like, what? What do you mean? She could barely sit. She was like, don't worry, I, I think we'll make it. I was like, okay, thank you for that. I was like, maybe I should get a little, uh, uh, one of the baby things, the baby collar, the baby buzzer, that thing. If that thing goes, then it's time for, for me to go. And Brother Eric, I'm going to leave the notes here. And you can go ahead and uh, I trust that you'll, you can pick up and take off with it. Praise God. But in any event, good evening, Bible Baptist Church. I am grateful to be here as I wait for the call of baby on the way. Some of you all know I'm, I'm expecting a baby girl any day now. My wife's due date is uh, this week, uh, but she can go any day now. And I look forward to, to holding her and to being there with my wife through it all. Uh, just, just an exciting time. Now, during my last message, I informed you that I have been dwelling on the cross. And I wanted to share what I believe is crucial in our understanding. My title for this evening is The Life of Death and the Cross. The Life of Death and the Cross. And this message, it, it's a, it pairs very well with this morning's message. This morning's message was an excellent segue. I believe the Lord knows what he's doing as um, I wasn't slotted to preach until Wednesday. But the Lord knows what he's doing, and I'm very grateful to the Lord um, for that. I'm very thankful for all of the men that, that preached, that ministered uh, to my heart. I've, I've eaten lovely from it. I'm just thankful. I'm thankful for the, for the praises, for the song, uh, for the worship being ushered into the presence of God. I'm thankful for the house of God. I'm thankful for the spirit of God. I'm thankful that we have a pastor on the way to us. Now... This message thoroughly convicted and preached first in my own heart. I'm reminded of when Brother Josh preached and said how it first ministered to him and, the, and that we were just coming along for the ride. It's the, same here, it's the same deal here tonight. Same deal. The preaching, if I can help it, will not come from my natural feelings, so-called talent, or mind. I've determined not to be in any way careless this evening in proclaiming this word. And the only way for me was first to move out of the way and let his word burn in my spirit. So, so now I can only hope to deliver myself this evening from the burden of, of this message in his service. If you will, turn your Bibles with me, please, to the book of Romans. Chapter 6, the book of Romans, chapter 6. Again, the title for my message is The Life of Death and the Cross. The Life of Death and the Cross. We'll begin our reading from the first verse and we'll read the first 11 verses. Throughout this message, I probably have two main passages. This is one of them. And maybe a couple of scriptures here and there. Romans, chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, 
that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, my King, my Redeemer, Lord God, I ask that you would be a fortress to us tonight. Be a strong high tower for us, dear Lord. Have a hedge of protection around us this evening as we gather in your word. Lord, I know in fact that you're pleased with us because you see not us, but the blood of Christ. And so we're thankful, dear Lord, for that blood that washes away all of our sin. Lord, I ask that you would bless the message this evening. I'm just your messenger. I ask that you would bless me, anoint me to be able to preach to your people this evening. I ask that you would bless the message into the hearts of those that would hear attentively, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Let me start with some context before I broach upon the subject at hand. In Romans chapter 5, Paul says that Christ saved us even while we were sinners. We're saved by grace, not by the keeping, not by keeping the law. And then he ends that chapter in chapter 5 in verse 20. He says, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. God's grace is always larger than our sin. If you're taking notes and you like to take notes, that would be certainly a note that I would jot down if I was listening tonight. God's grace is always larger than our sin. Then we move into chapter 6. Paul deals with a possible objection. He said, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? In plainer words, if grace is so easy, should we bother to change our ways? Whenever the gospel is clearly presented, and there's much more to the word clearly than the mere parsing of words, And we'll speak more on that a little bit. But this question comes up. If all our sins are so easily forgiven, why worry about sin? Should we continue to sin? And I think we heard on this this morning from our deacon's message. God forbid, Paul makes clear, we should avoid sin. Though our salvation does not depend on our success in quitting sin. Again, that would be another area that I'd probably jot down as a note. Our salvation does not depend on our success in quitting sin. If faith in Christ led to automatic victory over all sin, then the question would not come up. But sin continues to be a reality that we must deal with in our lives a reality that we must escape. Twice Jesus said, sin no more. In John 5, 14, dealing with a certain man with the infirmity for 38 years, and also with the woman that was caught in the adulterous act in 8, 11 of John. She said, no man, Lord, and Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. In this chapter, Paul is introducing new metaphors, slavery and freedom. Sin is not just something that we do. It is a power that works against us, a power that enslaves us, a power that we must be freed from. When we die with Christ, 
we are liberated from this evil slave master. We do not go on serving it, but we live a new way of life. We don't do it perfectly, but that is what the life of death and the cross truly is for. You believe in the death of the Lord Jesus. That's a good spot to say amen. And you believe in the death of the thieves with him. Now, what about your own death, your crucifixion? Listen to this now. Your crucifixion is much more profound than theirs, meaning those two thieves. They were crucified at the same time as the Lord, but on different crosses. Whereas we were crucified on the very same cross as he. In verse 6 of our text, in, of Romans, we just read, knowing this, that our Lord, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him. The Bible tells us we were in him when he died. How can you know this? You can know this for this one sufficient reason. The living, breathing word of God said so. It does not depend on your feelings. These are divine facts. That Christ has died is a fact. That the two thieves have died is a fact. And that you have died is a fact also. So we are indeed living by the life of death and the cross. Dead man walking. Let me tell you, just in case you missed that part, you have died. You are done with. You are checked out. The self that you despise, guess what? It's on the cross of Christ. And he that is dead, the Bible says we just read is what? Is freed from sin. We have changed now. Born again to walk in newness of life. This is the gospel for Christians. This is the gospel that we proclaim from the living word of the living God now. Now, given this that we amen to understand, I'd like to engage you and ask rhetorically, why is it then that people hear the truthful word of God and yet their lives demonstrate so little change. I ask because the answer can be multifaceted, depending on what perspective we engage. And I think among ourselves here, we have fleshed out the perspective as to the lost and their own responsiveness or lack of and willingness or lack of to hear these beautiful words wonderful words of life. This evening, however, my focus is not on them. My focus is going to be more us word. Yeah. We as workers of the Lord ought to know why the gospel we preach or witness to fails to gain people. May we approach this evening's message with a humbled heart asking the Spirit of God to shine the light in our own hearts to see where perhaps we have failed. Remember, this message preached to myself first. And, and it hurt me, but it's good because that led me to work out continually my salvation with fear and trembling. We stand on what we preach to be that of the whole truth which perfectly aligns with the living word of the living God, our Bible. Amen. Our focus is the cross of the Lord Jesus. And so what we proclaim is none other than Jesus the Christ and him crucified. In order to not only see sinners with fruit meat and saved from the penalty of sin, but also from under the power of sin itself. 
We know that our Lord died on the cross as the substitute for sinners. Propitiation, mercy seat. These are words that, that I go in depth to in my class in the tabernacle because we know that mercy seat and pro propitiation are the same word that's used in, in one section in Hebrews. But we know that all who believe in him will be saved without any works of their own. We further know that not only Christ was crucified as our substitute, but we, we also know that sinners and their sins were crucified with him too. Suffice then to say, we're well versed with the way of salvation. We give the gospel. We, we understand not to front load the gospel. I think we're well versed in that area of you can't know the good news without, without knowing the, the bad news. And we can present it well enough that those that hear seem at least, at the very least, to appreciate them so well in fact that when we witness to the cross of Christ, folks seem to be very attentive and even moved by our explanations. Am I still preaching to myself? Under these circumstances, we naturally expect many unbelievers to receive life and likewise for fellow believers to receive life more abundantly. Nevertheless, the results are surprisingly different. Although we find that people seem to be quite moved, we find they only really just retain in their mind the words or the wisdom imparted without gaining spiritually what we would hope and desire for them. There's no notable change in their lives or what we would call fruit. They understand the teaching, but their daily lives are not affected. They just store what they hear in their minds and their memory without having any practical impact in their hearts. And the reason I submit for this contrary effect is what convicted me to the fact that what I myself, or you, if it fits, have is merely ability to present words or wisdom. However, behind our spoken word, there does not exist that power which alone is what pricks the heart. Our word and voice may excel, yet the power of changing lives is missing in our word and voice. In other words, though we attract people to listen to us, the Holy Spirit has not worked together with us. And so our effort leaves no permanent results. Our word does not leave any impression upon people's lives. Remember the fragrance factor that I preached last and I mentioned the great woman of Shunem as an example? Out of our mouths, words may flow, but out of our spirit, no life has been released to nourish and to quicken those who thirst and seek to be quenched. Give that a moment to sink in and let the dust settle. I believe that the culmination of this attracting with just words is seen clearly in all of what our brother Tony preached about the false doctrine ministers. But yet, even when the doctrine lines up, right? What's that saying? Even a broken clock is right twice or something like that? Yet, even at those times, the result is people just gladly receiving words and not life. Yet, is not the Lord the life giver? John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief cometh not before to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. But instead of being channels only, Joe, that's your cue, brother, <clears throat> where this life flows from him and through us into human hearts, 
They instead remain spiritually famined. I submit, though, this is not just an issue for them over there in those uh, mega churches. If it was, I would not have been burdened with this message. In fact, it was me. And it may very well be some of us yet still. Certain occasions in my witnessing have caused me a great deal of anguish. Surely I thought they, those, them, they'll be here praising God with me. I'm looking, they're not. Don't get me wrong, I love my church family. But I don't preach come to the church. I preach come to the cross, amen? You come to the cross and you drink from the living waters and friend, I won't have to persuade you to come to church. You'll come by God's grace. You'll be here when the doors open. And if indeed you have tasted, then you won't be seeking the second heaven that our brother Other Dorf spoke about. No, sir. God's will is for you to be here. When the saints gather, you're expected among the ranks like a good soldier. That's another message, but I digress on that. Beloved, Paul labored to beget. Women, you know this means pain. My wife is about to labor in pain. Think about that. When you're witnessing this act of laboring, he labored. It's a painful process. Now, if you share this same experience, I would wish you to join me in sorrowing before the Lord and repenting together of our failure. What is lacking today are men and women who truly preach the cross and who especially preach it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now with the ground tenderly broken up, let us read the following portion from the word of God. Turn your Bibles now to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Verses 1 through 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, <clears throat> verses 1 through 5. <clears throat> and thy brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power <clears throat> of God. Now, why am I talking about preaching with power? A crucified Savior can be preached in divine power only by crucified preachers. This, pas this passage of Scripture is not primarily about the content of the gospel. It's primarily about the communication of the gospel. Paul refused to preach a crucified Savior through his own persona. He could have done so, right? He was of the learned. Scripture tells us he was a Pharisee of Pharisee. But uncrucified preachers succeed by human power. They build churches grounded in the weakness of human power. But strong churches, rock-solid churches, Bible Baptist churches that can stand up to anything are a miracle of the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit who empowers crucified preachers to preach. Those who have not been crucified cannot and are unfit to proclaim the word of the cross. The cross we preach to others should first crucify us. The words we preach should first burn itself deeply into our life so that our life 
is the living message. The cross we proclaim should not just be a message, a message. We should let the cross live out of us daily. Then what we preach will be more than a message, but a kind of life which we daily exhibit. Then we shall be able to impart this life to others as we preach the life of death and the cross. My flesh is meat indeed, declared Jesus, and my blood is drink indeed, John 6, 55. When we exercise faith to draw upon the cross of the Lord Jesus, is as though we're eating his flesh and drinking his blood. But keep in mind, eating and drinking are not mere words. It's not having a platform where you speak from. Just like in our natural world, after we've eaten and drunk, we digest what we have taken in so that it becomes a part of us. That is to, to say that it becomes our life. Our failure lies in the fact that we too often only use our intellect to examine God's word and only take what we've read in books and heard from teachers or friends as our message, using our minds then to organize the material that we study. Are you okay so far? Are you with me? Do you follow what I'm saying? Remember that this preached to me first. Amen. Though we have many good thoughts and topics, and though our audience may listen very attentively and with interest, our work ends there since we're unable to impart the life of God to them. The word we preach is indeed the cross, but we cannot share the life of the cross with others. All we have done is to communicate to them some thoughts and ideas. Do we not know that what people lack are not good thoughts, but life, the life of death and the cross? Some of the reasons for my failure in the past in delivering this message of the cross, I could not give what I didn't have. If, if all we have is thought, we can only give thought. If in our life we do not have the experience of the dying with Christ to overcome sin and self, nor the experience of taking up the cross to follow the Lord and suffer with him. And if our knowledge of the word of the cross is obtained just through people's pens and mouths, but we have not experienced it ourselves, then it is certain we cannot impart life. All we can do at best is instill the idea of the life of death and the cross into people's minds. <clears throat> Only when we ourselves are transformed by the cross and have received its spirit as well as its life are we able to then impart the cross to other people. The cross should do its deeper work in our lives daily so that we may have real experiences of the victory as well as the sufferings of the cross. Then as we proclaim it, our life will spontaneously be diffused into our words and the Holy Spirit then can flow out his life through our life to water the thirsty and weary that would endeavor to hear us. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter four, verse 20 tells us, <clears throat> excuse me, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Biblical Christianity in the world today is an ongoing miracle of God's gracious power. And if that is so, and it is, then Christian preaching can and must be in divine power. Let me just continue in that vein for a quick moment. If you turn to Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 through 19. 
that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ which passeth, passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. What a wonderful promise <clears throat> of scripture that is. That the Lord would have us to know what is the length, the breadth, and the width. That it would not just be reserved to a selected few. It would not be reserved just to so-and-so that went to this school or that school. The Lord promises, and I hang on to these promises, I, especially when I think about the road to Emmaus, and I read when the Lord walked with the two men that were talking. And if you read that scripture, the Bible says that the Lord expounded to them. And when I read that, I say, Lord, that's what I need. I need you to expound to me. Help me understand. I want to be able to speak with understanding. Help me, Lord. And if you ask for understanding, God gives it to you. Because this is a promise. It's not because I'm saying it. He promises that we may be able to understand. He says the fullness of God. We can't just gloss over that. That's, that's big. The fullness of God. Can you even fathom that? <clears throat> Scripture cautions us, though, that no disciple can be higher than his master. John 13, 16. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant's not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. And also in 15, 20. Remember the word I said unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, listen to this, they will keep yours also. <clears throat> wow. If our Lord must himself be lifted up and crucified in order for all men to be drawn to him, ought not we who lift up the uplifted Christ also be lifted up and crucified as to draw men to him? The Lord Jesus was lifted up on the cross for the sake of giving spiritual life to men. Likewise, if we desire to cause people to have spiritual life, we too must be lifted up on the cross so that the Holy Spirit may flow out his life through us as well. Since the source of life is from the cross, must not the channels of life also give Life by the cross. <clears throat> In John 7, 38. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. To flow suggests something natural. It requires no human effort, but simply follows the grade. There's no need to depend on eloquence or argument. By our faithfully proclaiming the word of Jesus' cross, people will receive the life which they lack. May the cross which we proclaim crucify us on it. May we bear the cross that we preach. May we first receive the life which we intend to impart to others. May the cross which we proclaim be that which we experience daily in our lives. If our message is to produce eternal effect, it must first become the food of our soul. Through the trials of daily living, it is burned into our very being so that we bear the mark of the cross in our every action. Those who bear branded in their body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Galatians chapter 6, 17. Only those can alone proclaim him. Let me remind you that sudden thought or knowledge obtained from books and study, it may please folks temporarily, but it will leave no permanent impression. We're reading the Apostle Paul and his success 
is based on the fact that his life clearly was a manifestation of the life of the cross. He not only preaches the cross, he lives it. The cross he proclaims is that which he has lived daily. So that when he speaks for the cross, he's able to add to his preaching his own experience and testimony. He knows the substitutionary death of Christ on the one hand. And on the other hand, he takes the cross of the Lord Jesus as his own experience. And he can declare, as you read, look at Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, a couple pages back. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And at the same time, he can further declare, if you just turn again right there to the, the last chapter 6, uh, verse 14, he can also continually declare, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. That's a deep verse. We know that Paul's gentleness, his patience, his weakness, his tears, sufferings, and chains, all of these express the life of the cross because he lives the cross, he's fit to preach it. Since Paul lives out the gospel in his life, he's able to beget many spiritual children by the gospel. Having the life of the cross, he can reproduce the cross in the heart of others. In reading 2 Corinthians 4, we come to know the inner experience of this mighty servant of the Lord. And the secret I submit to all Paul's work is found in this gem of a scripture. In 2 Corinthians <clears throat> chapter 4, verse 12. So then, death worketh in us, but life in you. He died daily. He allowed the death of the cross to work deeply in him so that others might have life. Whoever does not know the death of the cross does not have the life of the cross for other people. Paul was willing to be in the place of death that others might receive life through him. Only the one who dies can give life. But how, Lord, to die? I think the Lord himself gave us insight into, the real, into this particular real meaning of death. Don't turn there. I'll read it to you. John 12, 24, the Lord himself said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. This death is more than death to sin, to self, and to the world. It's deeper than all these. This death is the spirit which our Lord exhibited when he was crucified on the cross. Remember, he doesn't die for his own sins since he has none. Let us recognize that his cross declares his holiness. He's crucified wholly, entirely, for the sake of others. His death is due to his obedience to God's will. This is the meaning of death mentioned here. So we need to be delivered to death, not only for our own sake, that we may die to sin, self, and the world, but also for the sake of obeying the Lord Jesus in enduring the hostility of this fallen world daily. Yes, we need to let the death of the Lord so work in us that, that we may have real experience in dying to self and arrive at the state of holiness. Be ye holy, he said. 
but we should equally let the Holy Spirit do a deeper work in us by the cross, causing us to live it out. We must know the life of the cross as well as its death. Having the death of the cross, we die to sin and the old Adam ways. But having the life of the cross, we daily live in the spirit of the cross. This means that in our daily, everyday walk, we exhibit the lamb spirit of the Lord Jesus in suffering silently. And I just covered that in my class on the tabernacle. We were talking about Christ as the lamb. Jesus, when, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. 1 Peter 2.23. This death is a step deeper than death to sin, self, and the world. May the cross become our life. May we become a living cross. May we magnify the cross in all things. Are you still there? Do you follow what I'm saying? Are you with me? If not, I mean, do one of these numbers and then I'll, I'll go back or something. My last passage of scripture and then we're done. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10, passage I said, not verse. <clears throat> In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10, it says, always bearing about in the body of the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Bearing about the dying of Jesus, Paul was also willing, he was willing to be what the following verse shows us. In verse 11, <clears throat> For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. In his own experience, Paul himself, he may be, if you go back to verse 8 and 9, he may be, as it says here, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. With that, he allows what we see then in verse 12. So then, death worketh in us, but life in you. A death that can work must be a working death. The life of death, even the life of the cross, for the sake of the Lord Jesus, Paul is ready always to be delivered to death. He did not open his mouth when he was delivered to death, like our Lord, who could ask the Father to send 12 legion of angels to help him. Paul, under no circumstances, adopted man's ways to avoid these dangers. He would rather have the living death of Jesus, the life and spirit of the cross. He reckons himself dead. He reckons the cross as all-powerful because it enables him to be willing for the sake of the Lord Jesus to be delivered to death and to suffer persecutions and hardships of the world. How very deep the cross worked in Paul's life. Yeah, how good would it be if we too would bear in our bodies the dying of Jesus? Who is the person today who's able to tell the Lord that he's willing to die? Willing not to resist when he's put under all sorts of opposing and grievous circumstances. Yet if we desire other people to have the cross, we must let the same cross govern our walk first. It's only as the cross is allowed to burn into our heart through the fire of sufferings and adversities that we shall be able to reproduce it in the hearts of other people. The text in 2 Corinthians 4 tells us plainly, we're not, just to, we're not just preaching, we're manifesting the life of the Lord Jesus. Look at it again. In verse 10 and 11. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. 
We are to let this life flow out from us. It's only when we bear in our bodies the dying of Jesus by our always being ready for Jesus' sake to be delivered to death that we're able to manifest the spirit of the Lamb of Calvary in the things that we suffer for him. How sad, though, that we too often take the easy road, not realizing that there is no shortcut to the manifestation of the Lord Jesus. Remember what Brother Otherdorf said about the two heavens, right? Folks are looking for the two heavens. Think about that. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. The you here refers to the Corinthian believers, but together with all the Christians elsewhere. They're Paul's audience. Since the dying of Jesus has worked in his experience, he's able to cause the life of Jesus to work in his audience too, so that, so that they might have spiritual life. The word life employed in that passage is the word zoe in the original Greek, meaning spiritual life, meaning highest life. What Paul can offer to men is not merely his speech, thought, and a wooden cross. He offers to them the spiritual life of the Lord Jesus himself. This is not an empty verbal exercise, but an operation of the supernatural life and power of God that makes entrance into the thirsty spirit of his audience, causing them to receive life of the cross, which the apostle of God proclaims. And I'm almost done. We must reach this aim in our preaching and witnessing of the cross or else never be satisfied until it is so. To sum it up then, my last words then, all who do not live the cross as Paul did can hardly expect to obtain the result which Paul had. If we ourselves are not crucified, men and women, we will not be able to impart life to people in the preaching of the life and death of the cross. If there's someone today who's not sure, who would like to know about the life of death and the cross, I'd be happy, I'm sure a lot, any one of us would be happy to affirm these truths together with you after the service, if you'd like to pray. Let's pray. My Lord God, I thank you, Heavenly Father, for this message. I thank you, dear Lord, for delivering me from it, dear Lord. I pray, Lord, that it would minister continually in our hearts. Lord, that your word will produce fruit in its due season. Father, help us to, to walk in newness of life. Help us, dear Lord, to, to see that our life can become the living message. That although there are many words of wisdoms that we can impart to other people, and excellencies of speech. What is important, dear Lord, is that we're a fragrance to you, that we are living the life of death and the cross. Lord, I magnify your name. I thank you. May you be glorified in all things. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen.